1750 to 1774. Great Britain, the colonies, France, and Native Americans are all tied up in a key conflict that will eventually lead to France losing land in the territories and escalation between Great Britain and the colonies. In other parts of the world, new lands are being charted, music is seeing a shift, writers are producing many great works, and important people are, in general, making their imprint on the world. At the same time, things aren't completely great. There are many major natural disasters that humble mankind in the face of Mother Nature, as well as disease and political unrest that force people to work together in order to guarantee that tomorrow will be a brighter day. The Albany Plan of Union was the first proposal to unite the British North American colonies under one unit as a confederation. It was designed by Benjamin Franklin and first printed in the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1754. The discussion and adoption of this plan took place during the Albany Convention, which had formed for the purpose of settling on a policy to establish peace between the colonists and Native Americans, chiefly those of the Iroquois Confederation. The Treaty of Paris, signed on November 3, 1762 and enacted on February 10, 1763, brought an end to the conflict between France and Great Britain during the French Indian War. Although Britain had already conquered much of France's territory, including French Canada as well as territory in India and the Caribbean, the treaty required that France give up the remainder of its land in North America. Creating this treaty, however, had not occurred quickly. French King Louis XV's first attempts at reaching peace failed, and Spain joined France's side through the Family Compact. However, in June of 1762, both sides agreed to send ambassadors for negotiations. When Britain captured Cuba from Spain, these negoti negotiations became very tense. French negotiator Choiseul designed a treaty that would distribute land among the three countries. Essentially, Britain would control North America east of the Mississippi, Spain would own what was conquered west of the river and Cuba, and France would regain its territory in the Caribbean, India, and Africa. The Proclamation Line of 1763 was a boundary in the Appalachian Mountains by the British to prevent colonists from expanding westward. The main reasoning for this was to prevent further conflict with Native Americans that could lead to another expensive war. The British were also concerned that the colonists would use additional land to gain too much economic independence through agriculture. However, this line was not really adhered to, nor properly enforced. In 1770, Captain James Cook and his crew charted the east coast of Australia. During the previous year, he had traveled to Tahiti in order to observe Venus traveling across the sun as part of a global effort to learn more about the size of the solar system. After reaching Tahiti, he was told to find the fabled southern continent of Terra Incognita Australis. He couldn't find it at first, but he sailed to New Zealand and mapped the coast. He continued to sail west and successfully navigated the Great Barrier Reef to reach New Holland, which is modern-day Australia. He still thought he couldn't find it, however, and counted this as a major failure. He would continue to search southwards, eventually charting Tonga, Easter Island, New Caledonia, the Hawaiian Islands, and South Georgia, and he would also prove that Terra Australis does not exist. After trying and failing to prove to the Hawaiians that he and his crew were immortal gods, he was eventually killed by a mob in 1779. Between 1750 and 1775, much of the music composed was a mix of Baroque and classical styles amidst a shift in attitudes towards composition. Famous Baroque composer Johann Sebastian Bach died in 1750, while his son Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach composed in a more classical style, even publishing an essay on the true way to, of playing piano in 1753. Another famous father during the time, Leopold Mozart, father of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, also composed before his son's fame, most notably his violin textbook, Versuch einer Grundleichen Wienschul, say that three times fast. All the while, little Wolfgang Amadeus was gaining a lot of fame as a child prodigy, performing at his first concert at the age of six. Although only around 150 years old, operas were seeing reform, as exemplified by Christoph Gluck. Gluck's most famous opera, Orfeo e Eurydice, exemplified these new ideas, where the drama itself was focused on more, even with the inclusion of the famous Aria Che Faro. One of the most famous classical composers of all time, Ludwig von Beethoven, was also born in 1770. In Britain and Ireland, Lawrence Stern and Oliver Goldsmith both saw success in literature. Stern wrote the story of Tristram Shandy, whose nose was disfigured at birth and, disgustingly, was accidentally circumcised by a windowsill. That's something I don't want to think about. Goldsmith, on the other hand, most famously published The Vicar Vicar of Wakefield, uh, in 1766, about the fall and rise again of Dr. Primrose, after befriending a disguised wealthy man and having 
and then having two of his children married. Quite a happy tale. Although not as serious literature, Samuel Johnson, a notable author, published hundreds of short stories largely about practical morals in his magazines The Rambler and The Idler. And lastly, although no British poets were prominent until much later, Thomas Gray published his famous uh, Elegy written in a country churchyard, an early precursor to poetic styles seen in Romanticism by other, more notable poets like John Keats and Percy Shelley. Outside of Britain, other famous writers gained fame for their works. An escaped slave by the name of Phyllis Wheatley gained fame for her poetry, such as On ba Being Brought from Africa to America, published in 1773, and later she wrote To His Excellency George General Washington two years shortly after. Outside of America, France saw two major writers, Voltaire and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, publish their most famous works. Voltaire, a more philosophical writer, published his novella Candide in 1759 about the titular adult and his optimist mentor, Dr. Pangloss, exploring Europe and South America. They also managed to meet the Pope's daughter, who only has one buttock. Not really sure why that's important to include in a novella, but either way, it's a fun dramatic story that is both enjoyable to read and satirizes a variety of people and concepts relevant in Voltaire's era. As for Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he indulged more in the social sciences. In 1762, Rousseau published a pedagogical work titled Emile, which followed a young boy's educational journey, during which Rousseau expressed his philosophies on education. Shortly after, also in 1762, Rousseau published a more famous work, The Social Contract. The Social Contract, his magnus opus, dealt with government and society, and how both should be based on philosophies of his others at the time. Overall, a lot of interesting stories that were entertaining for readers came to be, but it was also an important time period where writing provided to be more than just stories, but also a way to criticize and rethink society or government. Major natural disasters caused great tragedy throughout the period. An earthquake struck London on February 8, 1750. The earthquake itself only damaged sheds and chimneys. However, the people of London were sent into a panic. Earthquakes continued in other parts of the world. The Concepcion earthquake of Chile in 1751 destroyed major cities and led to a series of tsunamis, altering the landscape of Chile and changing the paths of its major rivers. It was followed by the Lisbon earthquake of November 1, 1755, which struck Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula, and northwest Africa. This earthquake was one of the deadliest in history, destroying Lisbon and killing anywhere from 12,000 to 50,000 people. It increased political tensions in Portugal, disrupting progressions in Portugal's colonization plans. Mother Nature still wasn't finished. A major cyclonic storm occurred in October of 1756, damaging most of Britain and other areas along the North Atlantic coast. Buildings and farmland were destroyed in Northern England, as well as ships and shorelines being damaged in Germany and Denmark. Another very different storm of smallpox swept through North America as well. Several outbreaks of, the, of smallpox spread throughout cities and the colonies where epidemics occurred in both 1752 and 1764. The disease, spread by the microscopic variola virus, caused fever, nausea, vomiting, body aches, and, of course, pox. Due to a lack of proper medical treatment, the fatality rate and spread of small, smallpox were very high and led to many deaths in Boston. Boston was also where one of the most notable tragedies of this time also occurred in the city of, in 1770, the Boston Massacre. After many years of it being irritant due to heavy taxation, tensions between the colonists and British soldiers were, were very high in, in the 1700s. The city was occupied by British soldiers aiming to enforce British tax laws on anything from tea to any form of paper. The colonists rebelled against these new tax laws in protests in the form of vandalism and street fights broke out. Eventually, these tensions got to a point where ice and rocks were being thrown at British soldiers and, well, they had enough of it and struck back using guns, killing five colonists. After the massacre, people's angers were fueled even further. These tensions also led to the Boston Tea Party and frequent other demonstrations. Unfortunately, what they did beyond that happened after 1775, but I think we know how these tensions ended. Well, there you have it. These times may have, at first glance, been confusing and chaotic, but in reality, they produced many good things in literature, music, and politics. Although diseases and wars are constant as usual, 1750 to 1774 still finds a way to be a very progressive time period.